On this Father's Day, we are delighted to have you worshiping with us. I think two of the finest words in the um, English vocabulary, one is father and the other is mother. And I hope you were blessed with wonderful fathers and mothers. And I hope you are fathers, wonderful fathers and mothers. So let's begin the service by talking to our Heavenly Father. Lord, how thankful we are that Jesus taught us to call you Father. Because some of the best memories of our lives concern our parents. And we express gratitude on Mother's Day from wonderful Christian mothers. We do the same on Father's Day for wonderful Christian fathers. So may you be our father this day, and may we also appreciate your son who enabled us to join the family. For John tells us, but as many as received him, Jesus Christ, to them gave he the power to become children of God. This is our celebration to our earthly fathers and our heavenly father this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, boys and girls. Is this where our neighborhood VBS is? My new friend Kristen from Concrete and Cranes Consulting told us this might be a good place to learn about foundations. Can I join you? Thanks. My name's Thule. People call me that because I always have a tool in my hand. I picked up a VBS book from the drive through preview event. I've been glancing through it. It's not exactly what I was expecting. I don't see anything about steel foundations or measurement requirements. In fact, the first lesson is entitled The Foundation of Love. I'm not going to be part of some dating game, am I? No? Good. I think the book might be talking about a different kind of love. Listen to what Jesus says in John 15, 9. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. That's from the Bible. And the word Father is capitalized. So I think it means the Father. You know, like... God our Father, God our Father. Wow, that means that God loves Jesus, and in that same way, Jesus loves me and you. Well, that right there is enough to make a gal feel pretty special that Jesus loves me. I bet if more people heard this news, they would feel a lot better. And if we realized that Jesus loves all people, we might find it easier to love people too. Hmm, that's interesting to think about, isn't it? That God loves everyone. I wonder why they call this lesson the foundation of love. Hmm, Kristen from Concrete and Cranes Consulting said that Foundations keep buildings grounded and safe and secure, too. You know, less wobbly, less easily blown over when things don't go well. Thanks for letting me join your class today. I'll see you next time to learn about another foundation. Let me say today's verse one more time. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. That's John 15, 9. Till then, keep it rocking as we remain in the love of Jesus, like the verse says.
your heavenly Father, I see God in my Father's eyes. I see God, the Father's like the Father in the way He loves you. A Father's like the Father when He carries you through. I am my Father's daughter as I'm loving another. See love. your guide. Feel his strength by your side. He'll give anything. A father fills your pain when you do. Has the words to give you. He is everything. Like your heavenly father, I see like the Father when He carries you through. I am my Father's daughter as I'm loving another. See love from my Father in heaven through the eyes of my Father on earth.
on this Father's Day, our scripture passage comes from the Gospel of Matthew. And it is what you and I call the Lord's Prayer. You recall how the Father said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, you remember when you used to go out in the woods and come across a creek and you'd pick up some rocks and you'd try to make them skip across the creek. And then sometimes where the water was still, you would go down and look and by cracky, who would you see? You would see a reflection of yours truly. You know, a Christian father in today's world is a reflection of our heavenly father. And as we shared a moment ago, it was Jesus who taught us to call God Father. Our Jewish friends have a marvelous sacrosanct expression and feeling towards the name of God. They will not speak it. They will not write it in full. They will only write the prefix E-L, which is Elohim, for Elohim, which means God. And Jesus came along, and in the Sermon on the Mount, as you recall, which is in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, as you know, he said, and when you pray, the concept that he's given here is when you have a relationship with God, don't make it one of ostentation. That is show off. Uh, have a genuine, you know, relationship with God. And a lot of folk in those days would when time came to pray, the Pharisees, Sadducees would be at the intersection. Why? Well, when they prayed, they wanted to be heard and seen four ways instead of just two. And Jesus gives, comes down real hard in Matthew 6 about ostentation, about a show-off kind of faith. Not at all. So when you pray, say, our Father. Now, everybody who heard that was shocked because the word he used in the original language means what you and I use as our word daddy, which is very personal. I always call my father daddy. I don't know what you called yours and call my grandfather dad. And that was just the relationship we had. And I was blessed to have Christian postures in both of those fine men. I never knew my grandfather on my father's side. He was a Baptist preacher who died in 1921. I didn't discover America until 1932, but I did know my mother's father, Jim Brannan. And he was a farmer, Baptist deacon, and a human being. And I might add, he was a big Democrat in those days, but that's irrelevant. But at any rate, that was the relationship that we had. It was close. It was personal. It was meaningful. So I think it's important that we reflect upon the fact that Christian fathers are a reflection of our Heavenly Father. For instance, Christian fathers, like our earthly fathers, love like our Heavenly Father. What is the greatest attribute in the nature of God? Love. What's the first scripture verse you learned as a child in Sunday school? God is love. It's the most powerful idea in the Bible. Karl Barth came to this country way back in the 1950s. He was one of the eminent theologians of the middle 20th century. He was from Germany, the Tübingen School. And he came to the University of Chicago. 
5,000 professors of college and seminaries and theology gathered in a huge hall. My seminary professor, John Newport, was one of them. And when he came back, I recall, he said, let me tell you all, class, the most powerful idea that I saw and heard in that four-day conference in the University of Chicago. He said, Carl Barth has written the dogmatics, as you know, a masterpiece in Christian theology. Had a time of sharing. He was sitting at a table. The microphone is there. And microphones were distributed throughout the meeting hall. And persons could ask him, Dr. Bart, what do you think of the idea of X, of Y, of Z, and so forth? Said one professor went and said, Dr. Bart, what's the biggest idea in the Bible? Uh, Dr. Newport said he stopped a minute, took his glasses off, looked down and kind of fiddled with them. And then he looked up and he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Love is the most powerful idea in the scripture, as you well know. And a Christian father is exactly that. You know, when I think about a human father expressing love, I think of what's known as Team Hoyt. Have you ever heard of him? The father is Dick, the son is Ricky. In 1962, Ricky was born to the Hoyt family. Unfortunately, he was a victim of cerebral palsy. And the doctors told the father and the mother, you need to put him in an institution. He'll never be any more than a vegetable. And they looked at the doctors and said, no, he's ours and he's our son and we're taking him home and we're gonna treat him just like he was normal. They go home and they notice his eyes would follow them and so they, might, they figured out it must be some mental operation and, and functional going on between the ears. And the long and the short of it, they discovered through a marvelous high-tech experience that he was wired when he became a member of high school, which, by the way, he graduated. He also is the only cerebral palsy person to have a college degree at that, st at that stage of the game. And he said to his dad, through the rigged ability to talk through the thoughts, he said, Dad... There's a boy at our school who's injured and they're having a benefit run for him. Do you think we could be a part of that run? So his dad said, wrote him a note and said, Ricky, how can that take place? And he said, if you could push me in a wheelchair. And, and so the father said, I was not a runner. Now, I was in the military, but I wasn't in that kind of shape. He said it was a mile run. He said, okay, if that's what you'd like, we'll do it. He said, I didn't come in last. I was next to last, but we finished the run, and I was not a runner. And that night, Ricky said to them through the me mechanism of the rigged thing where the boy spoke of his thoughts. He said, Dad, when you were pushing me in that race, I felt like I was a normal person. And that struck a chord with the father, Dick. And he said, if that makes my boy feel better, that's what I'm going to do. They sold their house. They moved out to the edge of the community bought an acreage that had a lake, and he started running. Let me tell you about his exploits in running. This is unbelievable. In the next 20 years, he ran and pushed his boy in 1,130 events of racing, 72 marathons, Six Ironman triathlons. Now that's when you swim a mile. And he had a, a 
rope tied around his waist, and his boy was in a raft behind him, and he pulled him in a little canoe, and he swam for a mile. Then he got out, picked his son up, put him in a basket in the front of a bicycle, and pedaled for 25 miles. Then he picked him up, and he put him in his wheelchair, and his dad, Dick, got behind him and pushed him for five miles. That's an Iron Man involvement. Can you believe that? He biked across the United States in 1992 some 3,735 miles in 45 days, pushing his son, Ricky, because his son appreciated and felt normal when he was being pushed by his father. Interesting thing, in 2013, they were given the Jim, Jimmy Valvano Award by the nation. And you'd go to Rick and Dick Hoyt, Team Hoyt, on your t computer and listen to that. That incredible witness that's what you call a father's love for his son. But there's more. Christian fathers are always there. You can remember in your lifetime and in mine, I had a wonderful father. His daddy was a Baptist preacher. He was a deacon. He and my mother worked in the 9, 10, and 11, and 12-year-old departments in Sunday School of the Polytechnic Baptist Church for 104 years combined 52 years each. And my dad was always there. I played junior high and high school athletics. My dad would ride a bus because we didn't have a very good car to Gainesville, to San Angelo from Fort Worth, Texas and watch me play. He'd get home at three and four in the morning and he'd call at the Greyhound station and say, son, would you come down here and pick me up? And you know, I have to be honest, at the time I was sore from getting banged around. I was a single wing tailback and, and uh, took the ball, play, ran the ball about three-fourths out of the place and as such. And I drove down there and met him. I remember the sun was coming up the time we got home. And <laughs> I must say, I didn't feel real positive about that. But you know, when I became a father, I looked back on that and I, I was ashamed of myself for feeling that way. My dad was always there. Your dad probably was too. That best commercial I've seen by the telephone company is when a kid walks out on the basketball court. He looks around in the stands and there's his mother and his little brother. He's looking around and he doesn't see his daddy and his daddy comes running in to the gym and waves at him and the kid smiles real big and turns around and, and tips off the ball. That's what you call a marvelous father because that's the ministry of presence. It sends a signal that you love your kid. It's the same is true of a daughter as the case may be, whether it be in forensics, whether it be in oration, whether it be in orchestra, whether it be in soccer, you name it. But there's more. Christian fathers are caring providers. We grew up in the Depression we didn't know we were poor, but we were. But we always had enough to eat, though it might just be white beans and cornbread. We weren't bothered about it. I had an older brother four years old, an older sister two years old. Just about the time the Depression's over, World War II started, and everything was rationed. Didn't make any difference. Our lives were built around the home, the church, and the school. And that made all the difference in the world. But they were there for us when we needed them. And what it meant so much to us. And the same is true in your case. You could share many stories and many testimonies appropriate. But there's more. Christian fathers are caring providers, as is our God. You remember how the scripture says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. 
When we rely upon God, as Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and these other things such as food and clothing and other things will come into their proper place. And it's wonderful if you grow up in a Christian home where they say, never in my life did we have a discussion at the breakfast table Sunday morning, are we going to go to Sunday school and church? Well, let me ask you, is there a cow in Texas? That was a given. We knew we'd be there. And I'm glad that they brought me up that way because it made a difference in my life. And some of the friends I had in junior high and high school wandered away. They didn't have that kind of parents and discipline and their lives didn't turn out well. And that's, broke, that's heartbreaking when you see that situation take place as such. But a Christian father is a caring provider Casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Christian fathers and our Heavenly Father hold us accountable. We are to live dedicated and disciplined lives. Remember what Paul said to the Corinthian church? They played it a little loose with a number of things. He said, what know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Ye are not your own. You are bought with a price. Henceforth glorify God in your bodies, both of which are His. And that's what you and I are to do. You remember how the scripture says, do that which is right in the sight of your God. And thankfully, if we have Christian parents, yes, we have a tendency to kick the traces and jump the fences but they forgive and they teach us and they bring us back. And that's happened in our family and I imagine it's happened in your family too. And finally, above all, both fathers, our heavenly and our earthly fathers, introduce us to Jesus. I can recall in 1939, I had watched my brother and my sister, two years old, four years older and two years older, be baptized and become a part of the church. We had had a Bible school. We had had a marvelous, we already knew it by heart, but the theme scripture was John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And one Saturday morning, I went to my daddy and I said, Daddy, I think I'm ready to trust the Lord and be baptized. He said, well, son, let me get my Bible. And we went back on our back porch. It was a porch. It was walled in back room, three beds, my mother and daddy, my sister in the middle bed, and my brother and I slept in this bed. And we sat down on that bed, and he opened the Bible to John 3. And he said, now, son, do you know what this means? And he, in turn, of course I did. I'd been in church all my life. And I said, I just want to give my heart to Jesus. That's the term that was in in those days. And he said, well, if you want to give your heart to Jesus, let's just bow and you tell Jesus that you want to be a Christian and give your heart to him. By then, I was in tears, and I remember I prayed as best I could and invited him into my life, and how thankful I am the difference that he's made. He's made the difference in your life, too. You remember what the scripture says? The most powerful thing about becoming a Christian is change. Change. Tolstoy said, when I became a Christian, the things I thought were wrong and the things I thought were right changed places. And that's what happens when God comes into your life and you may need to trust the Lord today. He comes into your life only by a private door. He knocks, but there isn't any hardware on the outside of your heart and mind. It's all on the inside. And he has the power to push the door down of your heart and mind, but he doesn't do that. He respects our dignity, and he will not come unless invited. 
But when we open the door of our heart and invite him in, he comes in and forgives us and lives in us and assures us of his presence. You remember how 1 Peter said, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. It's a wonderful thing to know that God is always with us. I can recall when our oldest son tragically left us five years ago. For the first time in my life, I prayed almost all night asking God to give us strength and to give us courage and to heal the wounds of his leaving. He was a wonderful young man for which we're grateful and we cherish his memory but the wonderful thing about it, if we're a part of God's family and he's our father, there's a place for us when you and I breathe our last breath. The night before Jesus was really crucified, he's walking between the upper room and the Garden of Gethsemane. And as he walks along, here's what he said to his disciples. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And there you will be also. Thomas responded about like you and I may have responded. He said, Lord, we don't understand. We don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, man or woman, boy or girl, comes to me except by faith. And he said, he who cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. You may need to take that step today, or you may need to express gratitude to your earthly father, for he may not be with you always, as you well know. But as a father, you may want to rededicate yourself to plow your life into your wife and to your children and your grandchildren and in, be an encourager and a cheerleader and a for person to be their lives to model and follow. But whatever it is, we're thankful that God is our Father. Christ is our saving brother. And all of us who trust in him, but as many as received him to them became the power. He gave the power to become children of God. So that is yours and mine for the offering. May we pray? Lord, how we thank you that your love and grace and forgiveness is super abundant. You love us. You sent your son to die for us. He in turn gave himself and now he offers us a place in the family. And he says, those who come unto me I will in no wise cast out. So as we speak these moments, if anyone needs to take that step, may they do so led of your Holy Spirit and may we have a wonderful Father's Day expressing our gratitude and love to ones who've made a difference in our lives. And may, if we're fathers or grandparents or great-grandparents, be models of faith to those who follow after. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.
Worship Him. 